France Afrique, literally meaning France in Africa melded into one term, refers to France's powerful, inseparable synergy with its former empire in the African continent. It revolves around political and economic patronage, as well as military cooperation. For decades, the doctrine allowed the French to maintain their grip on Africa, affecting its former colonies to the nucleus, while being invisible to the naked eye. I'm your host Shivan and welcome to Caspian Report. Power doesn't corrupt, rather power inevitably attracts the corrupted. As African colonies declared political independence and broke away from their European overlords, the experience of French and British colonies were thoroughly different. Many of the British colonies gained independence through violence and thereby severed ties with London. Most of the French colonies, however, detached through non-violent ways, but retained deep running links with Paris. More precisely, in the 1960s, just before conceding to the African demands for independence, French leaders of the day, most notably Charles de Gaulle, believed that to fulfill France's long-term geopolitical needs, they needed to preserve the privileged political energy and trade arrangement with the former French Empire. In other words, a system of cooperation and compliance was necessary to ensure France's grip on Africa. As such, the Gaulle's administration crafted the CFA franc monetary system, with the CFA being the French acronym for French Colonies of Africa. The bargain gave the 14 newly independent French African colonies a stable and robust currency, but it also legally obliged them to put 50% of their foreign currency reserves into the French treasury, plus another 20% for financial liabilities. That means that the member states of the franc monetary zone only retained entry to 30% of their money, with the currency being printed under the supervision of the French National Bank. The settlement made sure that France's grip on Africa did not cease with the declaration of political independence. Even worse, if the 14 African states wanted to gain access to their own funds, they had to borrow it from the French at fixed commercial rates. This is what happened during the 2008 financial crash, when the CFA franc members could not obtain credit because their reserves were held in the name of France. The situation ended with France extending credit to its former colonies by using their own wealth. Furthermore, immediately after creation, the CFA franc financial system was split into currencies. The West African CFA franc was designated to eight West African countries, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau and the Ivory Coast. Meanwhile, the Central African CFA franc was assigned to the six Central African countries Cameroon, Chad, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, the Republic of Congo and the Central African Republic. In truth, both currencies remained effectively interchangeable since they were guaranteed by the French Treasury. This arrangement, which has been the case since the 1960s, proved to be a significant boost for French banks and the state, but it deprived the African countries of their wealth and growth. The system of servitude was best captured by former French president Jacques Chirac, who said that we have to be honest and acknowledge that a big part of the money in our banks comes precisely from the exploitation of the African continent. In 2008, he went on to say, without Africa, France would slide down into the rank of a third world power. Lawmakers in Paris brand the CFA zone as a monetary union, but in practice, it is an exercise of neo-colonialism. As long as the former colonies are denied basic political institutions to manage their socio-economic base, their sovereignties and political will are hollow. Today, some 158 million people live in the CFA monetary zone. And since both franc currencies are pegged to the value of the euro, which has been the case since the introduction of the European currency, the local African governments cannot set their own interest rates and thereby devaluate their own currencies. This hurts growth because the economy of the CFA zone depends almost entirely on the export of unprocessed raw materials with low added value. 
the inability of the African countries to devaluate the currencies to gain better export prices has come at the expense of GDP growth. Since 1994, economic growth in the franc zone has hovered around 1.5%. Even by African standards, that is poor performance. Some analysts argue that the CFA zone offers low inflation and a stable exchange rate. Although valid to an extent, these advantages are leaning heavily in favor of Paris. Now this is not to say that the French government is responsible for all the grievances in Africa, but for the African states, it's hard to grow when someone else controls the money supply, let alone the financial regulations, banking activities, and budgetary and economic policies. The franc monetary system breeds corruption, capital flight, and illegal activities. In such a climate, economic development is nearly impossible, as is the creation of a political system that meets the needs of the majority of the citizens because the governing elite is preoccupied with repatriating wealth acquired legally or otherwise. The farce peaks whenever the French state sends public aid. What happens is that France uses Africa's wealth to extend a line of credit to its former colonies with the condition that the aid money is spent on French equipment, goods or contracts with French firms. In January 2019, Italian Deputy Prime Minister Luigi Di Meo and leader of the populist Five Star Movement accused his French counterpart of manipulating the economies of the former French colonies in Africa. He blamed France for impoverishing Africa and thereby encouraging migration to Europe. Di Meo wasn't wrong. In 1994, the French government devaluated the CFA currencies by 50%. The idea was that it would improve the economic situation, but it did the opposite. The purchasing power of common citizens dropped sharply, unemployment skyrocketed, and the already fragile economies went bankrupt, leading to an accelerating migration of Africans towards developed countries. The legality of the French monetary system is dubious, but since the African nations cannot afford to file a legal case, the international community leaves it as it is. How much capital the African states lost since the implementation of the monetary system is unknown, but it has robbed the Africans of their wealth and prosperity. With France having nearly absolute control over the economies of its former African colonies, one can think of the CFA monetary zone as the French edition of the petrodollar. And as bad as all this sounds, it gets even worse. French multinational firms retain exclusive rights to purchase or reject any natural resources extracted from the soil of the former French colonies. Crude oil, natural gas, uranium, diamonds, gold, iron, etc. West and Central Africa is rich in raw materials and French firms such as Avera and Total have first pick. So only with the approval of Paris can the African nations sell their resources at international markets and French companies reserve the right to buy goods at the cheap since the Africans cannot devaluate their currencies. It's a foolproof trap. The franc monetary zone has given France a veto over the economic well-being of West and Central Africa. This unchecked neo-colonial policy could not have succeeded were it not for the African governing elites who rely on political, technical, military and economic support from France. Any leader that disobeys the will of France or tries to leave the franc monetary zone must deal with the consequent political, financial and military pressure. For instance, in January 1963, President Silvanus Olympio of Togo was assassinated three days before issuing a new currency. Other notable leaders include David Dako, Thomas Sankara, Maurice Yemego, Hubert Maga, Modibo Keita, all were assassinated or overthrown in coups as a result of their quest for monetary independence. Altogether, France has intervened militarily 40 times across Africa since the 1960s. Meanwhile, loyal African leaders were compensated with lavish lifestyles. In 1994, the Elf scandal revealed precisely how extensive the corrupt rabbit hole was. The oil company Elf 
offered bribes, mistresses, fine art, real estate, and so on to African politicians in order to secure their allegiance to France and maintain their exclusive rights to the local oil fields. The oil firm also lobbied French political parties to guarantee their support. This reprehensible arrangement explains France's long history of supporting undemocratic but loyal governments. For African dictators, France Afrique was and still is a form of life insurance. Seen in this light, the doctrine enables the French to pull a lot of strings on the ground, giving lawmakers and businesses in Paris unilateral access to the raw materials in the area. But the world is changing. Since the end of the Cold War, France's hold in Africa has declined. Rising economic competition from China, the United States and many other nations has plunged the French market share in the continent to historic lows. And with the passing of a new generation of francophone African leaders, the African youth is increasingly looking for alternative patrons. Yet among all the former European colonial powers, France is unique in its refusal to decolonize. In this spirit, policymakers in Paris are drafting a new arrangement to manage their influence in Africa with the weapon of choice being the French language. But more on this in the next episode. I've been your host, Shirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to our top contributors on Patreon for making content like this possible. If you want to gain access to written reports or other perks, visit patreon.com slash caspianreport. For now, thank you for your patience and Saul.